everybody knows how movie rentals are on Amazon. You can rent a movie for a few dollars, or you can buy it for a bit more. Of course, it's digital, and for less money than both, you could just buy a disc of it. I mean, I'm not even making this up. Looky here. Five dollars with free shipping on orders over $35 if you package a few items, but it's $5 while the movie streaming it would be about $13, like I said. You can clearly see that's a ripoff, and if you have a Blu-ray player, you're definitely going to want the Blu-ray version. So why am I bringing this up? Because this is going to lead to what I'm talking about today. Sony's PlayStation Now service. Now, what is this PlayStation Now? Well, let me give you a little history lesson on the past and how different consoles handled backwards compatibility. Now, until the PlayStation 2 came out, backwards compatibility in a home console was extremely uncommon. You had the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive have an adapter for the Sega Master System. However, the problem is the Master System was never very popular and neither was the adapter. Same with the 7800, except it was the reverse, with the 2600 being popular, but the 7800 being a total flop. And the Game Boy also had some backwards compatibility due to the fact that it was literally the same system with the Game Boy Color and the Game Boy Advance doing similar to what the PS2 would do, which I'm going to mention now. The PlayStation 2 offered a major feature, backwards compatibility. What Sony did was they took a PlayStation 1 processor, designed it into the hardware design, and allowed it so when you'd put in a PS1 game, it would load the game just like it would on a PS1, except without the serial port or the parallel port because those were removed, but as long as your game didn't need that, nearly every PS1 game would run due to the fact the hardware was designed with this in mind. This was a major selling point as the Dreamcast, GameCube, and well original Xbox because there was nothing before it of course, could not play games for the console designed for it. So every console for the next gen had some form of backwards compatibility. Now, I'm showing you a picture of the PS2 motherboard now. Keep in mind that silver chip and the two chips below it because you're going to see that make a comeback later. But first, I'm going to talk about how the other consoles pull off backwards compatibility. The first console is the Nintendo Wii. The Nintendo Wii pulled off backwards compatibility in possibly the easiest way possible. Reuse hardware. While this was one thing with the handhelds, Nintendo did this with the Wii, and this resulted in a cheap-to-make, underpowered console. While this brought Nintendo tons of money with casual games, it also ended up with the console being a total dud with third-party sales as third parties avoided the console because of its weak power. Microsoft took another route with their backwards compatibility, however. Having everything run in a software emulator if your console had a hard drive due to the fact that the original Xbox used a hard drive. While this was an easier and more cost-effective route, it also had the side effect that not only was there a whitelist with many notable games such as the second Deus Ex, Beyond Good and Evil, um, and various others such as the first Mech Assault or Metal Gear Solid 2 not being on the list, you also had to deal with stuff such as glitches, slowdown, um, other things that would not happen on an authentic original Xbox. And so, not only that, but Microsoft did not update the whitelist, and they haven't in a few years, after I think a few updates back in 2008. And to make matters worse, Microsoft has not updated the Xbox original store, so many games that would have been popular from Halo 2, to uh, Grand Theft Auto 3 and Vice City, to various others, are not on the marketplace. The PS3, however, was another thing entirely. You see, Sony, they decided to make 
the absolute most complex, most expensive to make console possible. Having everything from Blu-ray drives, which could read super audio CDs, which if you're unaware, was kind of a failed audio format intended to compete with the audio CD that never caught on for various reasons. And it also adds stuff such as an overcomplicated CPU, which was known for being expensive to produce and was mostly hype. So unsurprisingly, Sony, when it came to the PlayStation 3, one of the first things to be cut was the chipset. At first, it was reduced to just the video processor, which crippled backwards compatibility for many games, and then it was just removed entirely. And then later PS3s had no PS2 backwards compatibility. Or did they? Now, everybody by now knows about what happened to the PS3 when it was hacked. However, there were some interesting things done with it. For example, as you can clearly see, just like the PlayStation Portable, Sony has actually embedded a PlayStation emulator into it for the PlayStation 2. So as you can clearly see here, there are four files. One of them's an emulator for the PlayStation 2, if you have like the full hardware compatibility PS3, so all it does is emulate like the memory cards. The GXMU one emulates it for the ones that only have the video processor. Now here's the interesting one, the soft emu and the net emu files, which, well, everybody knows that Sony was trying to hire for a PlayStation 2 emulator recently. Now keep in mind, this is very specific. I mean, let's be honest, most companies aren't going to go out looking for somebody who knows MIPS assembly for a PS3 thing because keep in mind the MIPS was the processor used in the PlayStation 2 and 64 older silicon graphics workstations etc. So they're hiring for this and what could this mean? Well let me tell you what it means. Despite the fact that the PS3 is physically able to read a PS2 game and PS1 game Sony decided that instead of doing that, they'd release this emulator with PlayStation Classics. Now keep in mind the only thing keeping Sony from running disc-based games is the fact that they'd make more money off this and the fact that, well, there's nothing really because hackers have already gotten it to work with hacks on the PS3, so really. The only thing keeping you from playing the PS2 games, now keep in mind this isn't the best emulator, but it does run the ones that you can find on the PlayStation Store. The only thing keeping it from you is money. So, why am I bringing this up again now? About how Sony wants to charge you again just to play a PlayStation 2 game that's just emulated when the emulator is built right into your PS3? Well... Now I'm going to get to the main topic, now that I've told everybody the backstory. PlayStation Now. Now remember OnLive, that feature that was supposed to change PC gaming? I don't, but apparently Sony's trying to be just like that. Instead of playing the games on the hardware, you can now from either a Vita, a PlayStation 4, another PlayStation 3, Bravia TVs, or other devices in the future, you can stream games to them. So how laggy is PlayStation now? Just like on live, there was some lag with a leaked video that was uploaded from the closed beta, as somebody tried to play the game online, and well, let's just say it was laggy. And laggy. And it took like 30 to 40 seconds to even boot the game up. That says a lot. But not only that, not only are you not playing it on the physical console itself with no input lag, here's what makes it worse. Now, keep in mind, this is a game you can get for just $17.49 with free shipping on Amazon. Or you can get it for even less if you, well, click the new and go to the cheapest one you can find. You can get it for just $10 new on Amazon. How much is this game? Five dollars 
for four hours. Now keep in mind, you can go to Family Video and get a six day rental for about slightly less than what they want here. And you can get like a two or three day rental for like four dollars. So that's what you're paying here. Five dollars for four hours. You can go to a video store, a red box, and get a better deal. And a game that does not have input latency like this will for less. So not only are you not, quote, owning the game, and not only can you not use your physical disc, but to make matters worse, you now have to rent the game. So keep in mind, that is how you play games on this thing. You rent them. Even on live has a, quote, buy function. So, I mean, even though you're not even playing them on your own console, you can at least get them for longer than a four-hour rental. Because keep in mind, it's $30 for a 90-day rental, and you can get the game itself and own it for 365 days and as long as you want for just, I think, $10 on Amazon. That should say something right off the bat on how much of a ripoff PlayStation Now is going to be. And all this is, is a ripoff. I mean, is anybody even going to buy this considering how PS3s cost less than a PS4 does and you can actually play the game on the real hardware with no lag, which requires you to have a fast internet connection to try to get around, even though you can have fast internet and it still won't be the same thing. That's all I have to say on this. This is a ripoff. And this is what Sony wants the Vita to be. This is what Sony wants the Vita to be. Like I said, a PlayStation 4 streaming box and a PlayStation Now streaming box. Why do you think Sony is releasing the Vita TV? And considering you can get a 40 gig PS3 for slightly more than a Vita TV, that makes the Vita TV a ripoff, especially if you're going to be playing PS3 games on it. So all in all, PlayStation Now is a ripoff. And why does Sony think it's better to do this than to develop new Vita games? That's all I have to say on this. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more.